Right then, let's see how soon this starts recording so it doesn't cut off anything important. So today we're going to look at the clubs. So, so um, Isabel Myers, as she is known, I think she should be Isabel Briggs, but um, she mentioned Vanderhoop. She referred to Vanderhoop ten times and listed it, listed him in her book Gifts Differ. A book that has been read quite a bit in the typology community but those people that have read gifts different and i'm not one of them actually but i do have a book they've not seemed to have read vanderhoop because hardly anyone is on youtube talking about vanderhoop it's like it's it's shalina and me that's it um so let me show you the clubs Oh, what do we have here? Uh, an NT club. And then the counter club. And then we have, uh, so you can see here, Model V. We've got the NT club and the SF club. And I do have the clubs in Model A uh, at the top and bottom. The ego and id rose. So let me show you ENFP. Or oh, the extrovert of intuitive type with subsidiary feeling. Oh, and with the polarity. Which means that you've got uh, 1937. Although this English translation, 1939. Uh, one person viewing. So again, you've got the NF functions there. So. The main thing to show you is this diagram. Now, unfortunately, he wrote impulse, but he meant impulse to habit, because, like, the SI Dom chapter is really SI Dom. He talks about the farmer caring for his animals, who does things in the same old way. It's a very SI Dom profile, and it's like, and not only that is he saw guardians first uh, at least from a young other systems might have captured guardians like the other personologists like a lot and maybe a lot of the germans as well there was like four german typologists uh in fact i'll give you the i'll give you the flipping names so it's unfortunate it annoys me that um David West Kersey never read uh, Vanderhoop. I've done some inquiries, and it appears that he never read Vanderhoop, even though he did write in German. So here are the here are the Germans. Here are the German typologists, and Kersey was taught by the well the, his school, holistic school. What was it? I've forgotten the name of it. There, look, there. That's funny, Paracelsus. This guy had a massive ego, I reckon, because he called himself, his name was Theophrastus von Hohein, but he called himself Paracelsus because he thought he was better than Celsus. Um, and then, look, like Eric Adikis or Edward Spranger, Ernst Kretschmer, Eric Fromm. And so, Kersey doing his transcontextual thinking and like thinking, oh, I think he's describing these. Anyhow, so back to um, this diagram. So let's see if we think these are describing clubs based on these names. And it doesn't really explain it. It's just like got it stuck there on the diagram. Ethos. And so I'm thinking okay that refers to these two together the nf and let's call that club ethos and would you call uh the nt functions together logos and then the s t functions together technique that makes sense doesn't it and then morality for SF. Now, probably a lot of that is coming from 
Guardians. But I think certainly we can say the most obvious one is technique. That technique must be an intersection of these two. And we know that uh, NFs are focused on ethos. So we can sort of say, okay, these are the clubs. Um, so, and we know that Myers knew about conscious orientation when she wrote. Uh, so, we know Vanderhoek came up with it first. What we don't know, did Isabel Myers get the clubs from Vanderhoek? When did she read conscious orientation? Right. Uh, now, I would say here, will to control by systematization. I actually think that that's TI with SI. Because I was thinking about how is ENFP, TI vulnerable? And I'm thinking about, well, in their lower, lower right corner, are there two weakest functions? Well, sort of. It depends how you look at it. So it also depends on development. So I'll just do it like that. There you go. Will to right behavior. And you can see how model V parallels uh, the other model V. Uh, model H. Yeah. Model VDH and model V. So and F functions. And it's got quite a large area there for the modest servant. Uh, I sometimes call that fish's water. Uh, modest servant because the, the function serves the lead. Uh, it was also the first person to see this type as the champion. Champion of a cause. The advocator. And I'll prove it to you. Uh... Here, yeah. individual at the world tests are mainly related to NASA's concern in feeding relationships. There, the presentation of ideals and plans in a vivid manner. Um, so you're getting towards that role of the mediator advocator, and you get a bit more of that. Uh, the SJW, uh, the persuasive force of their intuitions, often capable of exerting powerful influence to exert social change, and then how they use FI. So he's got, in 1937, 1937, this, is much, this model is more advanced than Jung's four-function stack. And he actually goes on about the development of the counter nucleus. Because again, psychiatrist, psych, psych, psychiatry, a little bit more scientific than the news uh, therapy. Uh, although they'd be doing a little bit of psych, it's a little bit, but, but with diagnostics. Anyhow, so I'm getting off track. Is that in E? Right, that's model G. But the will to systematization being weak in, well, maybe a self-generated systematization, but they can do TE. But the will to systematization, because it's like the way that ENFP is weak with TI, I think it comes with, there's a sort of a, can be a lack of systematic integration of various sort of, points of view and something that's heavily systematized they're not so good at and these two are there you see sometimes oh, I think these two are the weakest functions that's sort of like what the data would show on average but it also depends on development you're going to get some ENFP resemblers with strong, with strong SE but from a sort of a uh, TI point of view these would sort of correlate to the one dimensional functions in model A of, and if we think about 
which types really like to systematize? Probably the most, I mean, I mean, ISTJ, KBN and MBTI ISTJ really likes to systematize. And again, SI and TI in ISTJ are going to be up here. Uh, so what, what I start thinking about with things like this is how systematic is ISTP? Are they, or is the ISTP tactically systematic? Um, closest thing I've got is my father, which would be like Mensa IQ literally had a Mensa membership card and the books. So he would be tactically systematic with gambling. Again, it's so that would be lots of different systems. Uh, remember once he organized the competition. Best price percentage. Yeah. All right then. Uh, looking for value. I got all technical stuff. I said, hey, like stocks and shares weren't better. But it's like artisan temperament. Well, I like you probably got a lot of our STPs in finance. Uh, what am I going on about now? Yes. Yeah, so from a TI point of view, you could say these two functions are weakest because you'd think if someone's say uh, ENFP, right? Their club functions are NF, and by default they're extroverted. So by that rationale, you would say, okay, that means any and FE are the strongest functions. If you just use those two factors, if you just use the two factors of default Vertin and club functions, then these would be the strongest and these would be the weakest. But if we introduce that other factor, valued versus unvalued, then it might be, well, is it NEFI or NEFE? Now, what we got from Dario's data, uh, Dario's data is... Um, the magic diamond from his you know that that test or the, although the cognitive processes ass assessment at keys to cognition.com just the, just the the symbol for two uh, uh keys to cognition.com that that he is he had Minor Barume, she analyzed. I mean, he could have done it himself because he's 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 um, Dario is very smart in that area of so statistics and stuff. Um, and that's the sort of the, that's sort of the secret source of the way he analyzes the EEG data. Um, is that she found she was able to find that sort of like law of psychological asymmetry. Uh, that those who sky, sky high with thinking will have the feeling in the lower half, those high with sensing will have the intuiting in the lower half. And so, and also, he got a lot of evidence for clubs as well. And he actually put that so, so Dario's research is consistent with the socionics arrangement of sort of like you've got the strong ego. And the strong id rows, and again with Vanderhoops there as well with the clubs. Um, so are these two? So again, valued. And so this is why, if it's if you if you value it, you're going to develop it. Like preferences of practice, practice needs to uh, ability. So given the right social field. Uh, so it's tricky. So usually with the arrangement of functions, it usually is in this sort of order, but sometimes these ones can move around. Like sometimes the tertiary can be like third or fourth, but it, it might depend on the environment. 
because the environment might draw out certain functions more than others. Like I think the environment uh, in first world countries is pretty much pulling, pulling on, drawing on a lot of TE, a lot of TE being a lot of drawing on. In, in other words, the role of a student, the role of a pupil at school is going to draw, is going to, that role, being in that position is going to draw on extroverting thinking. You are like taking in things from and thoughts from other people and but it's not not systems that you come up with yourself and that's where INTPs can struggle sometimes at school in that they're not yet smart enough to be able to TI it and think for themselves and it's like there can be a resistance to resistance to learning to, to do something in a certain way without yet fully understanding it because I want to solve it their own way um, Whereas uh, those who prefer TE can sort of like just do it, go through the algorithm. Uh, so but anyway, let's go back to INTP. So we've got the clubs here. Uh, we've got sensuous feelings and morality without morality without reference to self. Yeah, and he also talks about conventional morality. So. I work, okay, it's all about FE. Sensuous feelings. So, no, 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 SF. Right. So, he also talks about two kinds of, like, a way that this can be integrated. Sort of like, there's a, you get a bit of self dualization. It depends if this is under the control of complexes. So, this is where you get the integration of the, the B side of the personality, as I call it. Right, so these experiences form a kind of counter nucleus. I call it the counter, I sort of changed it to counter club to make it some more sort of build on what people already know in the mode of orientation, sensuous feelings and conventional moral evaluations. Yeah, and he mentioned these elsewhere, so I thought, okay, he's, he's talking about FE here. May then give rise to tensions despite the fact that they are felt to be something foreign to the self, especially in a five. Think of an INTP five uh, suppressing their feelings and emotions, or it's singular. In the case of characters with much polarity, so this is where the, the B side is very much conscious. There then arises a need to deal with the manifestations of the counter counter club in accordance with the standards of the dominant function. Right. So think of an INTP five that's like running through the feelings through the ti abstract thinking concerning conflicts and problems in feeling is in consequence stimulated right it becomes let's just do it like that right because this is the counter nucleus it just does this but i can't fit it on otherwise right um now now, Jung said that the inferior function was only I'm, I'm just reading, I'm going to put here we go, time for some FE <laughs> right, at a loss right, yeah, and I think that's a five thing but although, wait a minute, you, you said six wing five, I believe. No, five wing six, right, sorry. Um, yeah, I was thinking about this. This is tricky. Um, my FI is a little bit different, but like, I don't like to go there, but I go there in writing. Um, like put yourself in the center of a character. So if you go on my channel to our lower, it might be the top shelf, there's writing in there, and someone doing an audition, of the Wilma character, and she um, she couldn't she she executed the choice well, but the choice should have been a bit more like really like frightened to death when she thought she was being uh, possessed by the devil. But she's got a good screen acting style. Uh, but I would have, uh, if I was there, the director, I would have said um, to go to 
make a different choice because she executed the choice well. Uh, anyway, the point is with that character that um, in writing that, you've got to put yourself in the center of the character. I'm not an ENTP female. I'm not religious. I'm not thinking I'm being taken over by the devil. So that's an, uh, a one I would call that imaginative FI. There's the other kinds of FI, and it's where it's like, I don't think INTP wants to go there. Um, maybe it's not enjoyable. I think it's more enjoyable for IN the INTP resemble to experience FE than it is to experience FI. Because I think they usually experience FI in the negative, in that, oh, maybe it's a principle that's tripped over and they feel bad because that principle has been tripped over or all the sort of a nagging doubt there. Uh, also, the FI in me might be accentuated because of the six, the various things with the fixation six um, of the uh, ambivalence. And so, whereas the five, the nature of the five is more separating a I like that, as they say, where it's felt as something foreign and pressing it away. And so I call in model model V, I call this position, I call this role position, the contrarian alternative. Because it is sort of a relation. I, I came up with that term and then found out it was a term in finance. And it is actually, it actually, metaphorically, it actually does the same sort of thing where it's, if you want to sort of hedge your bets, it's the contrarian but alternative. And it's like, if, and so I, so part of me thinks that this function can, this slot can be used a lot because it's like well, the other half of the mindset. If you're so, like, if someone's very, very much like introverting and rational or right witly in English, then they are going to, maybe go to the other half of the uh, of the right Whitley uh, function, introverted right Whitley function. Um, again here, but then we've got a bit more integration here. But where there's greater freedom in thought, we get a morality founded on principles and reason, capable of giving rise to fresh insight into the life of feeling and morality. So morality is going to go more towards FE I sort of split it like this, ethics, FI, morality, FE. So, Amy Lynn, are you a member of my uh, any of my groups? There are links in the About tab, and if you scroll to the bottom. Right. So, capable of giving rise to fresh insight into the life of feeling. The ordinary orientation of the introvert of thinking type may, as a consequence of this kind of complication, undergoes considerable alteration. So, van der Hoop describes himself very snappy naming system, Vanderhoop. An introvert with thinking type with subsidiary intuition. So, tin to us for INTP preferences. Let's go for another one from Amy. Seems like I can intellectualize other people's feelings and understand how they're feeling through empathy, but then it becomes vulnerable when trying. Yeah. Yeah, it's also like different kinds of like an intellectual kind of empathy. Um, so, for example, the INTP resembler that learns a lot about typology can sort of have, but then that function is going to develop itself anyway. Uh, Daisy INTP, wait a minute, wasn't she the one that's, that, that came out later on? And said that oh she's not an INTP and I thought oh yes that's why you did a video about um, uh, that you enjoy abusing your friends. Uh, <laughs> oh I'm always calling my friends ugly. So um, so I don't know if that's her. No that I uh, know no that's not her. That's super senior Sydney. And see that set off my FI. I did not approve. Unsubscribed. All right. Yes. And she's she's the one that later came out. Oh, I think I'm not an INTP. Good. We don't want you in the club. INTP shouldn't be behaving like that. All right. So, FI moments. Gotta calm down. 
Right. Um, what else? So let's go. Uh, Walsh, you're here. Let's go. Uh, let's have a look then. Daisy INTP. Okay. Okay, pink hair. Right. Okay. I'll, I can. I will remember. I should remember this. All right. So, Amy, I'm open to questions. Because you know it's quite early here. Um, oh, where's that clock? There you go. Nine fifteen. All right. I'm. Uh... Right. Okay. So, um, what I'm going to do is. Uh, I'm going to change the nature of the video a little bit and I'm going to put model V on. I'll put the board on for uh, INTP because you've got INTP preferences yourself. So, one moment, the graphics will be back. Oh, let me just show you just how Vanderhoop really took this idea with the rings model and ran with it. Oops. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So it looks like Vanderhoop. Okay. It looks like Vanderhoop was religious. And he thinks, okay, religious experience. We're using all of the, uh, I call them super functions. Uh, right. So instinctual experience. Nice. Vanderhoop, he, he dissimulated me. He dissimulated me. Vanderhoop dissimulated me. What he did was, in terms of assimilation, so this is something that actually is in you, where it's like, when you read something and fit it into what you know, but Vanderhoop dissimulated me. I read this thing about instincting, and I thought, damn it, he's right. He changed my thinking. I changed the He, he dissimulated me. Uh... So, but then it goes, ah, if you then reframe it as instincting, then what do we get? Well, we get a lovely consistency with an artisan instinct and a guardian instinct. It's more than just sensing. If you, if you know artisans and you read the Kersey chapters on artisans, idealists, guardians, and rationals, and artisans seeking stimulation and yearning for impact and seeing themselves as adaptable and all of these things that you get with extroverted sensing and this sort of like feedback within it. So someone's in battle, someone's in combat and they are enjoying that activity that is bound up with the sensation. So that's part of the instinct. It's all bound together. It's not just sensing. So Van der Hoop would say things like, in looking at this function, I noticed that uh, sensation was not the only factor, but the, um, he would call it form of adaptation, but the form of adaptation was governed by sensation and emotional, emotional, reactions there too and a certain inclination towards action and a certain kind of intelligence and so the instinct leads to again certain emotions and leading towards certain actions so if you get that with say the guardian the instinct is sort of the, the, the comfort in safety comfort in the tried and true and then it leading towards certain actions which where it's like, oh, they're doing the thing that they're comfortable with and in their comfort zone. And then also part of the instincts, you've got uh, the harmonizing part of SI, which is all of the comfort sensing stuff. And there, I'll just get back to this bit in a moment. Right, because I know you've got this one here. And um, all of the comfort sensing stuff, like, and from a Kersey point of view, Kersey wrote, most medical doctors are guardians. Uh, and they got, and as Jeff says, guardians will tell you about their medical problems. 
So if you look at the predisposed roles, the Kersey, so Kersey had a system of intelligences, the Kersey intellect, as I call them. And he had the tactical intellect, the logistical intellect, the diplomatic intellect, and the strategic intellect. And half of the logistical intellect is provider. It's providing, supplying, and providing, protecting. And that providing, protecting correlates to SI with FE. And the providing, supplying correlates to FE, SI. So it's very much all related to self-preservation stuff for others and guardians being beneficent, actively kind in a practical way rather than benevolent. Um, I'm definitely irrational and problem solving is my thing and I haven't read too deep into functions, but I definitely know I NTP. Sometimes I question ENTP versus INTP. All right, okay, here we go. I feel like I just seen something, maybe even though FE is the inferior function that the NE brings up. Yes, which is why in these videos I tend to get expressive because it's like when the INTP is NE, you can see it in their face. Uh, now, INTP is not going to be doing the FE thing when they're surrounded by a load of small talk. And it's like, uh, yes ah go 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 <laughs> that kind of thing all right um right uh what do we got here fantasy oh right interestingly enough so let's let's because this can be hard to interpret right okay right experience associated with, with the sphere of feeling and it's interesting that he's like tagged fantasy as sort of like non-verted uh, feeling, or rather verting ethical experience. That's interesting. Why is... Oh, wait, maybe you say an NF? Maybe you say an NF? Uh, wait, he's got the f That's interesting why he's done it like that. And, and he's got it right through the centre of the person, like the unknown self. And so it's interesting because that's the sphere of feeling. Philosophical experience... Oh, he's giving that really within the sphere of sort of like the outside, the thinking part. And then experience is associated with the sphere of thought. So you've got like the extroverting part, the introverting part, and then the bit that the sort of the non-verting thinking. Uh, the IU experience. That's interesting. So this is intuiting and this is instincting, as I call it. The AHA experience. So this is inspiration. The NR intuition. Let's have a look. Right, okay, so this is all that class. And in this class, these three experiences connected with intuitive images. Right, okay. Thoughts, right. Oh, here, oh, here we go. Missed this key at the bottom. Animal form of meaning. Yeah, just experience. But like I said, if you see a dog, a dog has a lot of emotions. But I don't think a dog has feelings, but I think a dog experiences emotion. Uh, happiness, anger. Like, there's lots of things. Uh, so it's like, the only difficulty, the, the, the awkward thing about the way Van der Hoop defines instincting, there's one downside. And that is that you've got to have a nuanced... Uh, delineation of emotion and feeling but that might be no bad thing especially for nts to think about the difference between emotions and feelings as in and i have a physical correlate for this so the emotions we are bound up with the limbic system and the limbic system does have like integrate some and you can have what is it subcortical responses and stuff i'm going to get to that because now uh, you can have like responses. I mean, yeah, small talk. I feel like it's in... okay. Small talk is boring, but if you get me excited about something, then yeah, I can talk. Like, yeah, especially if it's on an abstract topic of interest. Yeah. Um, ooh, oh, I'll, I'll show this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to show this. Then I'll do model V. Actually, where did I get the? Uh... If I try and find the folder that I used 
with Haley on Saturday, I suggest that that video that I did, the after socionics number eight. Uh, that made it. Yeah. Um, the difference between feeling and emotion. Okay. So Van der Hoop talks about. It gives the example of. You walk in like, and there's people walking around you. Someone bangs into you. You have that initial reaction, right? It's not like like someone bangs into you and you have a feel, you have you have like any reaction. It's like is that fe or is that fi? No, that is emotion. And it's like then you see, it's an elderly person. It's like oh, oh, and it gets more complex. And it's like oh, oh dear. And then, then it colours it. Then it becomes more sophisticated, more cerebral. Oh, it's an elderly person that bumps in. Oh, it's a small child. But initially, it goes from the anger then it's like oh then it gets more sophisticated as it becomes more cerebral uh or you, we can con contrast some things lust which i would say is limbic versus love which i might say is a feeling anger is an emotion indignation uh, a feeling so if it's more cerebral but then we're starting to get into the area of the if a feeling being more cognitive and that there is a um maybe a thinking context to the feeling um so yeah and also vanderhoek came up with a very interesting point about feeling types and something like it is the impersonal objectivity to which thinking aims that is the opposite of feeling but not all thinking aims at impersonal objectivity so only in a particular way are thinking and feeling opposite and that is when thinking aims at an impersonal objectivity because if someone's because someone's thinking about their feeling it depends how they're trying to approach it if someone is thinking about their feelings in maybe a five-ish way and like really like putting it at odds and maybe squishing them down and sort of pushing them away then maybe that is in opposition and frequently you can get a situation of thinking and feeling being opposed like what is the smart action and what do i feel it's like you, there are certain but there are other situations where i think it can be synergized so another way of putting it is when we talk about opposites is if we say okay what we mean by opposite here is mutually exclusive and then if we ask the question is thinking and feeling mutually exclusive no no it's not but i can give us but with the non-judging functions as i call them because i do not like to call them perceiving functions because that is a cognitive process in cognitive psychology and that is within the sphere of thinking that is thinking combined with sensing where you get perception so, for example, if I hold up an object, I'm going to hold up two objects. One that you'll recognize or act know, and one that uh, you won't know. So, what's that? Right, calculator. Right. That has gone into the sphere of thought because you've recognized, you've act knowed what it is. This, what's that? Right, well, you don't know what it is. It's just some of you might, especially if you're hipster. What is it? Right, it's just within the realm of the senses. It's just a thing. It's like you see the sensory details without knowing what it is. Right, I'll put that back. Or if you saw some strange symbols from a foreign language you do just see the sensory components of it oh it's gone blurred if i'll throw some light on the situation if uh if if you um you know what it is it, it is that within the sphere of recognition uh, so that's perception anyway the non-judging functions these are mutually exclusive especially if we frame it right over the years, I eventually end up with framing things in the correct way. So, 
the instinct of SI, introverted instinct term, the instinct is towards, no, it's off the top of the typewriter. <laughs> Um, the, ins the, the, the instinct of SI goes towards to stabilize, to stabilize the situation that is mutually exclusive from the main theme of NI development. Development versus stabilizing. Stabilizing, developing. These are mutually exclusive. Uh, so that is our NI and SI are opposite. Now, NI, so this eventually I called, like intuition of time is quite good for NI, but it's a little bit broader than that. As, you know, it's a common theme that socionics is a little bit too narrow in its definitions. Um, so for instance, extroverted instincting is more than just fighting. I mean, there you go. I mean, the fact that, that socionics calls SE force and sonics, that force and so I mean, if you read about it, it's like there's an instinct involved in there. It's not just sensing. And even with comfort sensing, yeah, there's an instinct in there, like a self-preservation kind of instinct. But it's more than that. So if you socionics people, um, I, I will say, look, there's instincts in your SE. There's instincts in your SI. In force. In comfort. Uh, if someone's feeling comfort, there's an emotional reaction to it. Right, um, Mira and someone else. Yeah, you got mirror neurons and stuff, and Dario and Ardi's stuff like correlates to, I call that the EEG level that correlates to the uh, functions. Right, and so you've got like four areas that are mainly active in TPs. And actually, ESTP has the highest activity here, deduce solution, reason verbally. And this one, categorize and define. Yeah, INTP has the most activity there. Way many factors at once, ENTP has the most. Integrate vision and sensation, probably at ISTP with their um, visual spatial intelligence. Um, I actually feeling that, oh, I'm gonna. Right, also something else I'm gonna make part of um, after socionics, I anglicized it from post socionics to after socionics is Eventually, I'm going to get into semiotics. Um, now, there was a, a guy out there, and I can believe that this guy was the greatest American philosopher, uh, that hardly anyone knows. Charles Sanders Peirce, spelt Pierce. And his semiotics, and semiotics in general, just blows the asinine information dichotomies out of the water when it comes to that internal external dichotomy really pisses me off because okay this is what a certain socionist entp would say thinking is external because it doesn't need to be reinterpreted well you've just had a debate with somebody where you've said that you couldn't understand the terms that they used so if it doesn't need to be reinterpreted why don't you understand the terms that they used it does need to be reinterpreted. Thinking does need to be reinterpreted. Because, because and also, this person has, has made a complex equivalence between the words that someone uses and thinking. Well, it's a sign. And it's the, and I can give you the simple version and then I can give you the Charles Sanders Purse version. Actually, I want to bang on about this. I'm going to put on um, Charles Sanders Purse, but I want to get through these comments. Like TI is interpreting and feeling logically before FEO FI. Oh, it gets all integrated and mixed up, especially in me. Um, this is all dynamic. This is why I like to really emphasize the verbal aspect of it as a process. And so I will call it, say, extroverting feeling. You are extroverting your feeling because if you say extroverted feeling, Extroverted is past tense of a verb. When was it extroverted? When was it extroverted? It's it's dynamic. Um, extroverting feeling, introverting feeling, depending on what is sort of like default or situational. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Okay, okay, next one. It looks like something that would be the bottom of the vacuum cleaner, like a sweep or a broom or not a broom. You see now, you see, 
you see how that sensory detail is entered into the sphere of thought as you recognize it try to recognize it dustpan no it's the top of a typewriter oh yeah that's with the that lol was uh, the lmao was probably right here we go um Oh, a bunch of typewriters. Hey, you can sell those. I mean, the, the price of them. Get your TE on. Oh, that makes sense. I actually just carried a bunch of typewriters out of my grandpa's basement. I went... Hey? That's a bit weird. Grandpa's basement and when she said... All right, who, who's the she? said that I made the connection when she said and when she said that I made the connection all oh, right so there'll be the grandmother that said that probably grandma and when she said that what's that in English eld mother uh... <laughs> yeah but your grandparent might say that that sounds a bit rude <laughs> you're putting the elderly in there it's like with I remember one comedian said that old age pensioner was like like a triple hit you're old you're aged and you're a pensioner all right whereas senior hey we prefer senior that's what they might say uh make the connection because yes i had to put on the top of the title that's right okay I actually just seen something on reddit about eeg scan player yeah uh i just looked in say so stuff but i've been looking into this object oh no not objective personality it's nonsense right it's a lot of it in the way they operate dodgy dodginess i'm saying this in public like you don't say that something is double blind when it isn't and it's not even blind partner when that partner happens to be your spouse and nobody has independently verified their their methods and they sort of piggyback onto a system created by tony robbins and so uh, they'll go on about so they'll say te is tribe logic yeah, NTJs are really about the tribe. INTJs are really about tribe logic, aren't they? No, they don't give a monkeys about the tribe, INTJ. So the temperament context changes the nature of the TE. Tribe logic works if you're thinking about STJs because they're guardians. So what TE does not care about whether it's tribe logic or not. It just cares whether it works. TI is more likely to, someone in a TI state is likely to say, oh, I want to do it my own way. Because there's a tendency for TI just to do it its own way for the sake of doing it its own way, because it's part of the way that TPs are wired. Uh, oh, that's the conventional way of doing it? Oh, I'll do it my way instead. I'll do it differently. Whereas TE doesn't care about doing something differently for its own sake, just does it the most effective way. So the TE doesn't care. So the NTJs don't care if it's the conventional way of doing it. They're just doing it the most effective way. Whereas, like I said, a TP, they might be just for the sake of being it different. Just for the sake of showing their creativity. Because I think the TPs are more interested in doing it their own way, putting their own spin on it. And it's like, so they'd actively go against what is uh, conventional. Uh, because it makes it more interesting. Because I think an NTP, if they're coming up with a problem, and it's like, of course, it depends on the problem and how interesting it is. Like, oh, I, I think I'll solve this my own way. Uh, if you can't interpret someone's thinking, yeah, so the way they, they operate, they hold out a carrot. The way objective personality works, they hold out this carrot as somebody becoming a sort of like somebody else who can like, diagnose people i wanted to have a word with that person but nobody has actually reached that status of i don't know what they call it but somebody who can type people in their system and but the problem is you can't then have a word with that person because then that person signs a non-disclosure agreement or at least they work for shannon and dave so there's no way to independently verify any of it and also they have that problem of having subsequent dichotomies that cancel out uh, a dichotomy at a higher level. And what is, what is the upshot of all of that? It means you can never have something which is falsifiable.
because you can then say that there's this subsequent dichotomy that cancels it out. That's not good. It should be, your system should be falsifiable. Then you can test it out. Um, that's one of the issues with DCNH. Like, I like DCNH, but it can be used to rationalize, to sort of like, to prevent falsification. Because you can always say, oh, that's the exception because this is the subtype. Well, you can never then falsify the higher thing because you can always say it's an exception because of subtype. Um, but DCNH, it is there. I go with the data. Dario has shown EEG correlates of uh, DCNH. If you see, it's, it's the event before last time. So I think it's the 22nd hangout with Victor, with Dario. And it's and he was going through Megan Lavota's EEG data. And what we did is we, Victor separately typed Megan. I did an interview with Megan and he typed it from the interview and some, some, some subsequent questions as well. And eventually he came out with um, EIE, ENFJ creative subtype for Megan. And okay, that's the same that Dario does for her. And then we're able to get some sort of like different angles on the same thing. So uh, if you can't interpret someone's thinking, how are you going to know it's right or wrong? I have a feeling I might know. Okay, so this thing about um, interpretation. So this then, it's like with language. Like, and this, I have a big, maybe it's like postmodernism in me and that it's like, people mostly understand each other and are speaking the same language. And so we can say there is an empirical part that transfers across. And there is a subjective part that doesn't uh, transfer across, where people can take things the wrong way. Um, or it's like Wojtek and I have a different understanding of the word empathy. So this then mirrors the idea of you, of you've got, he said objective, where he got translated as object, really meant empirical. You've got the empirical and the subjective. Right, I'm going to bang on now about Charles Sanders Pierce. Oh, did I copyright those pages? Did I scan those pages? I don't know. Uh, okay, I'll scan them now. I'll scan a page now. Uh, where's the book? Semiotics book. I don't know if I did it. Um, let me go back to this point. Right, here we go. So I didn't make a lot of sense. I carried the typewriter out. And the top of one of them came off. I had to figure out how to put it back on. And that opening was where... Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where, yeah, yeah, where the, uh, the, like, the spools for the, the ribbon. Yeah. Right, I'm going to try and scan a page from Charles Sanders' purse. So it was the way he did. Okay, so he has these different things. Like he then's got he's got like firstness, secondness, and thirdness, and like different kinds of signs. And so you've got the um, the icon, which relates to the object in that it resembles it. So it's like emojis. They resemble the thing that it's referring to. It resembles its object. Uh, I'll give an example. That resembles its object. Uh, and so that would be an icon. Uh, an index is linked to the object via causation. So smoke is caused by fire usually usually and so you can say that smoke is an index of fire and then you've got the one where the link is conventional so maybe an emoticon shortcut where it means something by convention uh okay so that would be this right so that's just 
that is just by convention that those letters stand for that right yeah but we could maybe try typing you it depends right um so anyhow so what i want to do is i want to do a scan oh dear i want to try and get the work the right page in this that's quite a complex one right okay firstness secondness thirdness uh try and get okay uh that page might be a bit simple um firstness secondness and thirdness right that's a bit complicated but uh i'll do that one i'll do that as a complicated one so anyway so what you've got with semiotics is it blows apart the dichotomy of internal external because also if you have the internal external dichotomy you're saying that sensing and thinking does not need to be reinterpreted and you're therefore saying that there is no subjective factor in thinking and sensing at all which is ridiculous and so then you are then saying that TE and TI can never be wrong. And again, and so it's like, then you're not making, then then that distinction don't makes no distinction between a valid argument and a sound argument, so that you can have a valid argument where it's all internally consistent, but it's based on false premises. But that's so this is why it's so serious can go down like the way that people interpret ti as structural logic and i'm like no it's subjective and because you need to acknowledge the subjective aspect and the empirical aspect of thinking now that you you do get some thinking which is neither empirical nor subjective and i would argue that that is the case with much of logic because it's like it's always going to be right there's always going to be the right answer there's no subjective aspect to it and there's no empirical aspect to it so right yeah here when you're saying i've looked into some of it but some of the terms are a bit weird some of it i can relate to but some of it's yeah yeah right um i want to work out which page to scan uh, if I want to do that, because that gets complicated with firstness, thirdness, and secondness. Um, uh, okay, I'll do that then. Pull the NTs out there. I'll do this. I'll do this table. I'll just put that over there. Uh, what else? What am I thinking of here? Okay. Being a TP, yeah, yeah, is literally get in fight with the dishwasher because I want. Right. Yeah, but that's the thing is like that's where there's a very useful cursy dichotomy called utilitarian versus cooperative. Now it has to be a nuanced a bit with the cooperative types in that guardians are more compliant in their cooperation and nfs are more about consensus but certain areas where the nfs get a bit fi on something and will go against the consensus but many times some of their principles are from a sort of a group think uh but then again there are those that sort of will go against the consensus of it so it's more related to not whether the nf thinks for itself it's more about when it uses a piece of machinery or an object is it cooperative or is it utilitarian and probably the nf is like well i've not got they don't feel strongly about um how something should be used and so they just do it in like the um because it's not something that's important to them but they can have like ethics and be very much independent in that area but when it comes to tool usage 
they're not going to have a bee in their bonnet about, oh, I want to do it my way. Now, when it gets to creativity, they're going to be more, because a lot of NFs can have a four in there and they want to be like creative and do it their own way. So it's more about tool usage. And in tool usage, it's your NTs and SPs more likely to do it in a utilitarian way and not read the instruction manual and that look. Uh, although I think the NTJs are probably more likely to read the instruction manual than the TPs. Right. Uh, yes, the groupthink. NTPs, NTPs especially don't like groupthink. Uh, oh, yeah. It's like just adding stuff to like. If anyone like points out an exception, they can always say there's this other coin, this other like, like a theory should be falsifiable because then you can test it out. Right. Um, just going to scan this. Now, this is going to be quite complicated. Um, right. Is it images? I think it's images. Books. Right. What have I got here? Uh, in graphical guides. Oh, semiotics. Oh, bloody hell, I've got it in there anyway. I hope I've not rescanned the same page. Well, actually, I've not. 30 to 31. So I've not got that one. As luck would have it. Right. So, right. So I've got these pages. I'm going to put this on screen. Right. So the semiotics, I don't like internal external. And also because there is, there, for some people, the world of feelings is a lot more empirical than the world of um, thought. And so it's like, it could be like what, what someone's words say versus sort of like their affect display. And it's like, oh, they said this, but if you look to the way they said it, the voice and all of that, it's like, that's how they really felt. So... Okay, so I'm going to get this on screen. So this is images. Books. Introducing. Semiotics. Oh, ah, so it did put that one on there. Oh, I put the most complex ones on there. Okay, here we go. Maybe I should do this. I'll, I'll, I'll scan the simple page as well. Right, group thing. Where are we with these messages? Masculine, feminine. Right, I've got to get the simple page on. Uh, which is... So, the point is that if you say... If you believe that... Thought does not need to be reinterpreted because it's external. It contradicts um, semiotics. Unless you then try to say, but a lot of time people are going to think in language and language definitely needs to be reinterpreted. You get semantic drift. Meanings of words change. You know, you don't, there's not a transfer from one person into the other. So when Voitech says empathy, and uh, we discussed this. Wojtek and I have different understandings of empathy. My my understanding of em empathy is much more um, FI based and influenced by uh, Robert McKee because I go towards it as so. If someone really, I so I I put the idea of audience identification into the idea of empathy. Uh, where it's like where the person sees that somebody is like me or well, not me in particular but like so if you empathize with somebody you've got i think that's related to fi in that and also like a sort of a vicarious thing of which is different from sympathy so i would say that someone can sympathize with an animal in pain but not empathize with an animal in pain. And I think that, okay, if you, if somebody, 
an INFP in particular might very much relate to a character in a story. And that strong relation and almost living your life through that character is, is, is produced with a, a bond of like seeing that this person really is like me. And it's like an introverted feeling thing. And so that's why I put empathy, that kind of empathy under FI. And another way of sort of a supporting line of reasoning is that ESTPs and the NTPs are really bad at that, that kind of uh, empathy. So it's like we've got to have different names for it. Now, interjecting someone's emotions and sort of feelings, uh, that you can say that's effy, uh, but when it's as, as an imaginative component to it, or it's like, if you really much identify with the character, and then that character gets wronged in a program, and the person vicariously, the, the identifier gets vicariously hurt, because that character is treated uh, badly. So for example, there was a film with Jay Ryan called The Last Man, where for the first half of the movie, it does a brilliant job of getting the audience well, I assume it gets, it got me to empathize. It got the audience to empathize with the main character. The rest of the movie then proceeds to do a number two on that character. And then so vicariously, you're doing that to the audience. So, but my understanding of FI is very much related to what I've absorbed via Robert McKee in that it's like based on identification, based on that the similarity with with the person and so the greater the similarity the greater the empathy but but some people can have a sort of a wider range of empathy so ESTP can empathize with an ESTP uh, with a well-written ESTP character so I know I so I know someone Actually, if you watch if you watch the homicide reviewers, we've mentioned this in public, that Jeff Jeff's ESTP son related to the character of Kellerman because Kellerman was written as a smart ESTP detective, and when um, that character, the the writers did badly treated that character badly, Morgan was annoyed, so. So an ESTP and can empathize with that character because they see that character as like them. The question then becomes is maybe when it comes to type, certain types have a greater field of empathy uh, for people who are less like them. Um, right. Right, let's go save this what page is that 20 to 21 anyway so I, I got a book on Charles Sanders Pierce eventually I might read it if only as I'm, I'm on a five right um, uh, I'm gonna sh now I'm gonna show the initial graphic here we go this so Let's go through this. Okay. okay you got ILI. I have to be real. I have no idea what you're talking about when you say first. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it, this is complicated. I'm going to have to go through it like bit by bit. Um, that's why I bought the book, this Charles Sanders Pierce book. I don't go for instruction manuals. Ah, there you go. Well, you're definitely not an STJ then. I don't go for instruction manuals, and when I was a kid, I used to like reading the troubleshooting section before anything else. You know, for read the rest. yeah. So that's like a utilitarian approach, right? You see, that's probably where NTJs are more like. I'll read the instruction manual because it's more efficient than doing it my own way. Whereas the NTPs, the TPs, might be more like sort of like as a point of pride do it their own way and the STJs will have an urge to do it by the manual uh, so you have to like 
test it out and ask ask NTJs about their approach with it. Uh, but I get the feeling that, uh, yeah, because it's like they don't. It's again, what is efficient for the NTJ? Uh, what it might be. What I imagine, typologically, I'd think NTJ would look at the manual, but not as carefully as the STJ. Because he'd be like, oh, I got it. I got the gist. So that it might be that. I think my prediction would be that STJs would read the instruction manual and follow it more religiously than the NTJ. Because the NTJ being an NT, might be, okay, I get the principle. So it's like maybe a little bit in between the pole of like the TP that wants to do it their own way and the STJ that's completely by the book, NTJ a bit in the middle. That's my prediction. Um, so. Maybe I do get sympathy and empathy confused. I feel like I feel the vibe of a room, like if someone doesn't like me and I feel it as someone else. Right, okay, so that's all signals. I would say those are like, and in fact, I would say that's an index. So a smile, an index of happiness in that the happiness causes the smile. And this is usually, now people can fake it, but then the eyes don't move right. And it actually to fake a smile well then people can change their internal state to a happy state and then the um those little muscles around the eyes will contract and you get the wrinkle around the eyes which is consistent with a real smile but then someone's just altered their internal state um so for instance someone can think of how to use emotion memory uh simply an empathy computer yeah it's like different kinds it's like but the way it, it's just my particular understanding of empathy i like to do it like that now there's other ways of like you can interject someone's emotions and feel the emotion or rather interject someone's feelings in an fe way but that's different from imaginatively taking in the person as oneself because you see that the difference there is the subjective factor the empirical factor with FE is you are taking in maybe the signifiers of the emotion. Well, you're taking in the indexes, sorry, the indexes of the feelings. And that is, and the way the brain is wired, you are reacting in response to that. Because as a part of the brain, attend to social feedback, feel embarrassed, like region T5 behind the left ear, where it's like they see someone. So for an FE person, especially an FE dog, they see someone who's upset, they become upset. It's just the way that that index of someone being upset, the index being the facial expression and the tone of voice and like body language stuff, that sets off something in the brain and they get a corresponding feeling. Um, and this is, this is all part of the older parts of the brain. Well, not the really, really old parts of the brain, but like, um, right, Amy Lynn. Right, so once I've gone through these questions, I'll get back to this this thing here. Right. And any time I'll cry is if I'm really frustrated or mad. Maybe that's weird. But right, okay, that's fair enough with it being a, a weaker function. The one countency that I've always related to is... Right, okay, house. Right, again relating to the character that is part of that is fi if i believe there's the feeling involved in your experience of relating to the character because someone could relate intellectually to a character's point of view and that might not necessarily be empathy you see what i mean because these these cognitive processes being dynamic it moves from sort of one sphere to another and these spheres are sort of like the label that we attach on it um here we go i feel like tjs just want to get it done they don't care about the way they get yeah yeah the way they get the, the most effective fastest way is the way they go they're more efficient than yes and the temperament of the stjs is, is to think that well for them the reason they go by the book is one there's less risk they're not going to get in trouble because, especially in a work situation, if an STJ goes by the book and it doesn't work, well, I'll just follow the manual. If an NTP 
does it their own way and they fail, they're going to get in trouble. But the NTP has got more of like the arrogance to maybe do it their own way and thinking about the positive. Hey, I did it better than the book. Ha, huh, this book, nothing. It's out of date. Like the, 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 it depends, like especially ENTP. And so the motivation and it's like, and so this is why guardians, if they have a good idea, they tend not to implement it until later on. You can get creative subtypes of guardians. I think Kristen on this channel is a creative subtype of ESTJ. So, for example, she implements Galenka's social, well, whatever, he's made a big thing on the social benefit rings. The idea of the social benefit rings in education. And we're going to be doing an event. Uh, we hope to do an event maybe within the next month. It depends when Dario and Victor are available. More efficient. Yeah, okay, I'll give you three kinds of efficiency. Um, I usually forget about this. Uh, the kinds of efficiency. So, uh, the NTP kind of efficiency might be to get it perfect. Um, but then it, like, it all takes a long time, and then it's like, it's 30 years you've been designing this tank um trying to get the perfect design um the ntj might think the minimal viable product and the um and also trade-offs between price and effectiveness and stuff like that um and again the ntp would like try to um might spend like twice as long on a solution that's like 10 percent better um stj is their point of view is, well, if you go and buy the book, that's the most efficient way of doing it because that's the way that is proven to work. And so it's a kind of an ethos which is the right tool for the right job in the right way. And like I said, if they get it wrong, they don't get blamed because they're following the manual. Um, now, the smarter ones might then say, oh, we need to adjust this to the manual. Uh right here we go i can sense fake people everywhere it's just a fit yeah yeah and then i like i get i can read their body language it's not about what they say it's how they say it yes exactly and so that's a signal as well as well as the words that are said so this idea this so i think socionics having that information dichotomy where it says thinking is external and doesn't need to be reinterpreted and same with sensor but we know there's a subjective side to sensor we know there's a subjective side to thinking and it goes against reality and if we are saying that a word language represents thoughts then let's do these this triad in uh in uh charles sanders pierce right a light source here whose sign is a self-contained dyad of the signifier and signified, I insist that the sign consists of a triple relation. So you've got the object, so it's there, and it refers to him. But how we imagine it, the interpretant. So, so soon it says that thinking doesn't need to be reinterpreted. This is the reinterpreting of the sign. But this is where it gets more complicated. And that is, um, I've not scanned it in, but what you get is the interpretant is another representament for another interpretant. So it's like when you look up the meaning of a word in, in a in a word book, English for dictionary, then what have you got in there? You've got other words. <laughs> and these words are interpretants for other concepts. And then if you look up those words, other words, all these system of signs, arbitrary signs, and so they're going to be symbols. Um, and so you get this infinite, I think it's called semiosis. So, and then meanings of words change. Now, the, the complex thing that he came up with was firstness, secondness, and thirdness. And this is interesting. Uh, okay, and then I'll... So, I did some notes on firstness. Right, did I do some? 
Okay, that's that. I think I've gone around the houses there. Right, okay. Um, right, okay. Categories as they relate to each element of the sign triad. Categories as they relate to beer. Right. Right, so firstness, I would say that that is like instincting, in that it's like the essential qualities of the um of the uh of the sign of the representament so like i said the quali sign is it's like the sign has a quality of the thing it's representing so it's like uh with the smiley face that resembles the the feeling of happiness or it resembles a thing on someone's face um and again resemblance the icon now this is where it gets really interesting is like the quality of firstness is possibility and then the fact and then, then it's like it's you really like stretch your brain with this uh i've not got all of the scans um let me on the let me get to firstness so Yes, directions are good. If I feel like I can find a better, more efficient way of doing it, I'm going to try it. I'm always looking for a better way sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, rational is looking for efficiency. Yeah. Um, and it also depends about what the person cares about because uh, an, an NTP might just do a TE thing that they're bored about and they just want to get through it. Um, so let's do on about firstness. Right, an immediate object, a dynamic object. Right. This, this is about the interpretant. Right. Am I gonna? I'm gonna do some some scans. The final interpretant, the dynamic interpretant. Right. So page. Have I got page? Right. I've not got page twenty six and twenty seven. And that one is not scanned properly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan these, uh, the proper results. Thus an interpretant is produced. Okay. Right. Let's go through this in order because it is complicated. Right. So... We can then start thinking about, instead of thinking about information, if we think about signs, um, so we get sort of FE signs. We don't really get, but like I said, there's no, so it's like, um, if you're looking at someone's facial expression okay there was a there was a i once read about um so they did a, an experiment where i think it was in russia or the soviet union at the time i can't remember where they took a i think it was an actor a show players reaction shot and they put the reaction shot after certain events and the audience read into the same facial expression feelings that were not there but they were colored by the previous events so they had read those things those feelings in so, so it's just by the way it was edited they read those things and it showed that people were using context to read into the significance of what they were saying so it's like a particular word having a slightly different meaning within a particular sentence that sentence may be within the paragraph that paragraph within the chapter that chapter within the book and so this might be an example where the way Carl Jung uses the word objective so you might look up at the dictionary definition of objective or go online and you've got like three definitions of objective, like really, really, really true. Like you can say logic is many kinds of logic are objective. 
or you can say objective as in you need to be objective as in impartial or objective as in empirical and then you might you might see the way Jung uses the word objective in a sentence and you might you still might not know then you sort of like go to like the paragraph okay but then if you go to like the whole of book and it's like oh previously he's mentioned objective and it looks like he's referring to the object in the empirical so the, the context and the frame of reference and now when you read Jung uses the word objective because of all that previous context it's like oh he means empirical but it's that all of that context beforehand has changed the meaning of that word so I'm just going to save this and then I'll put that on screen because it's just a bit more a bit easier to understand 22 and 23 right so you've got the interpretant 22 and in fact there is there is a flipping good example of if as socionics says that those part of people in socionics who are going on about information metabolism and they're saying that thinking does not need to be reinterpreted then why do they have to explain their terms to people shouldn't when they say a word shouldn't it just transfer directly into somebody else's mind and not need to be explained it has to be explained it has to be reinterpreted right all of, they all need to be reinterpreted this, this, this then correlates to there's the empirical factor and a subjective factor and that's reality now also I can give you another example um, I'm just going to change actually I don't need to do that I just need to open the other one and then go to a different page there that's it so we've got the sign triad you've got the sign you've got the thing it refers to and then the interpretants right I'm gonna go through some more messages now um, what is time right yeah we're gonna to get to I'm gonna to have to build up towards the firstness secondness and thirdness because it's quite it's quite it's very abstract thirdness seems like how people instinctively tend to see faces so like when you look at the moon you see the man in the moon that's what I'm getting from that uh, actually thirdness relates to the realm of laws the realm of generality it's very interesting when you sort of get into it and then sort of map functions onto it and sort of like ways of thinking about functions uh, hence it seems like thirdness was using any um if you're forming a general law and then so you've got a thing called a legi sign which is related to thirdness but it's like looking at something from different planes right so wouldn't wouldn't that be using si because as i know it introverts sense in his memories and what you already guessed would be uh, it's part of it part of the si is the instinct and you are looking for consistency with the past and with the tried and true so that's part of the instinct of si the guardian instinct um so and the way that guardians store memories with a lot of sort of like emotionally significant memories and associations and subjective associations and that lot and with their associative speech memory is a big part of si but it's also a big part of any cognitive process in that if you look at cognitive psychology like even with language well the memory is involved because you have to know what the words mean what they refer to and uh it's just like if you're reading the book carl jung and he writes about and you see the word objective and you remember oh but he meant the word like that empirically and so but someone's so like previous experience is going to be part of the si it's just that the instinct of si is just that the guardians look towards the past as a guideline instinctively the artisans look towards the present because they're immersed in the present context this is why dario's calls his se chapter in eight keys of self-leadership immersing in the present context and so it's part of the part of the temperament so 
And this is something that Linda Behrens came up with, is that the functions are used in the context of temperament. So fi, now this can also be explained by function pairing. So fi with se being different from fi with any. Um, so, and then here we go, and then would come into the ti having to interpret the si. Maybe. So now we're getting on to a little bit more of, um, I'm just going to make that a little bit bigger. I'm just going a bit. I don't know if you need to see me. Um, is there much of a difference? How much do that? Okay. Um, so we'll just go through this, and I'll actually do a, I'll scan another page whilst I'm uh, explaining this. We're going through this, because I sort of only looked at it recently. Right. So we're full. The world is full of signs. What's that? Sisi es un sigmi. I don't know what that means. Something like signify or something. What is this? Here we go. The object is that which the sign representum stands for. Right. And so this is an icon. In that, that is not a pipe. It is a painting of a pipe. Well, actually, it's a printed book showing a painting of a pipe so there was that famous painting that was i think it was center pattern pipe this is not a pipe because it's a painting of a pipe and so that's a an icon and it's related to the object by resemblance just as this drawing here uh, relates to its object of charles sanders pierce via via resemblance or this here relates to a hand via resemblance. Um, and again, the object is that which the sign representative stands for, although it is slightly more complicated than that because it can be an immediate object. The object as it is represented by a sign, a dynamic object, the object independent of the sign which leads to the production of the sign. The sign or representative is quite simply something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. Most often, and then I think that's about ah, the interpretants. This is the thing it stands for. And this is why thinking needs to be reinterpreted, especially if it's via language. Right, okay, here we go. The interpretant is the trickiest of the lot. It is not the interpreter, rather it is the proper significant effect. Most often it is thought as the sign in the mind that is the result of an encounter with a sign. So, for example, if I say the word empathy... You've got a system of signs in your mind as to what I mean by that. Now, Voitech's understanding of empathy is different from mine. Um, and so here, this is a good starting place, although it is more accurate to consider the interpretant as a kind of proper result. I might point at the sky, for instance, and rather that simply registering the significance signification of sky, you would look in the direction of the pointing finger. Thus an interpretant is produced. It gets tricky. Right, 28. No, did I do 24? Right, it's the firstness, secondness, and thirdness that gets interesting. But we've got to go through this first. 24 and 25. Right, then it's going to be a case of 24... 25 save right then I'm going to do the next page which redoes that so that's not right oh it's back to there right right now it now yet yeah, like an object there would be more than one kind of interpretants The immediate interpretant, which manifests itself as the correct understanding of the sign, e.g. looking at the sky and seeing precisely the star that the finger points to. The dynamic interpretant, which is the direct result of the sign, e.g. looking at the sky in general in response to the pointing finger. The final interpretant, which is the relatively rare result of a sign, which functions fully in every instance of its use, e.g. Looking, looking at precisely the star that the finger points to, 
and realizing that the pointing finger indicates that the star is specifically Proxima Centauri. Right, so, but it's still not the end of the story. And this is where you get the semiosis. Right. Whereas Saucer's sign, signified, signified, needs to combine with other signs to take part. So how is thinking external, especially if we're using language? Or we've got to put all these qualifiers in. Oh, well, I don't mean language. I mean thinking without language. Uh, okay. Whereas Saucer's sign needs to be combined with other signs to take part in a flow of meaning. Pierce's version of signification has an inbuilt dynamism. Remember. So, if you're having trouble understanding this, like me, doesn't that prove that thinking needs to be reinterpreted? It's not an instant transfer of understanding from one to another. Right. We said that the interpretant is like a further sign or sign in the mind. As such, the interpretant has an important role to play in the sign triad. In its guise as interpretant, it is also able to assume the mantle of a further sign representament. This places it in relationship to a further object, which in turn entails an interpretant, which is transformed into a sign representament, which is in relation with a further object, affecting another interpretant, and so on ad infinitum. So it's like looking in a dictionary, and then the definition is other words, and then looking up those other words, and then those other words, and those other words. It's worth remembering this potential when we consider Derrida's relation to semiotics. Right. Right, I'm going to now go on to the next page. Oh, wait a minute. I need a, I've done another scan of that where I've marked some things up. 26 and 27. And this is where we get, oh, maybe I didn't do that. Okay, I'll put that in there, 26 and 27. Right, this is where we get a bit of firstness, secondness, and thirdness. And I can have some feedback from you people about what it all means because it is quite thought provoking right and this is where we get on to it so what on this you can read someone else's mind which start their point to them and what they're going to have, you have some form of work yes exactly it's going to be there's a an empirical factor and a subjective fact which is why another reason why it's ridiculous to me is that i've got i've had a book on uh uh and this is where i found out about semiotics in like doctor who the unfolding text and science fiction audiences where you've got audiences watching the same thing, but they get different meanings from it, different interpretations. So it's just like, if you watch a television program with your knowledge of typology, you're gonna get something different out of it from somebody else. So the meanings, it's like I said, it, you've not got a one-to-one -one transfer of information. Context is very important and it's, it's and, effectively we've come to a point where thinking is verbal especially when you if you if it's then because the idea in, in socionics is that you understand thinking information well it isn't mostly that information in the form of a language now maybe if it's like you could say within mathematics it's more sort of like precise maybe but in terms of language language is slippery and this is something that derider went into as so if you look at the postmodernists, they know about slippage in language. Um, so let's go on to this. Unless you can read somebody else's mind, as I pointed out, you're going to have to have some form of language, whether it be writing. Yeah. So, yeah. And so language is a code. And so this is our linguists. And so if you see language as a code, but again, it's right. So here we go. This is where it gets really interesting. The principle of an interpretant producing further signs is, in everyday terms, quite familiar. We're all aware of how one sign triggers a chain of associations which eventually seem quite removed from the initial sign. Right, guardians with associative speech. So you got, you're there with somebody else, someone says something, you think of something different from the other person because you've got a different frame of reference from the other person. That goes under the heading of the subjective factor. So all of this comes under the fact that Carl Jung got it right in dividing the functions between empirical and subjective. What socionics does with its information dichotomy is it gets rid of a proper understanding of vertness by having this asinine internal-external dichotomy where sensing and thinking don't need to be reinterpreted and 
and feeling and intuiting can't be it's just all internal but like i said for certain people the world of feeling is more real to them than the world of thought and we might put all that under words um so it's like the indexes of we can say that the words somebody uses are sort of maybe symbols of their thoughts even if they are using their symbols but i, I would argue that someone's affect display is closer to the object the feeling state of somebody than um maybe words but it depends on the person for other certain fe dom they can really interject the feelings of somebody as if they are um having those feelings as well is that part of the brain that dario mentions behind the left ear in right handers so what and what more have we got here uh in semiotics this potential and it is only a potential is simply because normal practice dictates that we need to go to work execute chores and go to sleep etc rather than constantly produce signs it's often referred to as unlimited semiosis right so pierce's view of the sign function is clearly quite clearly 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 quite complex when one considers the way in his semiotic in which signs necessarily generate further signs a story has it that schubert after playing a new piano piece piece was asked by a woman what it meant schubert said nothing but in answer returned to the piano and played the music again the pure feeling of the music the firstness was its point right so this is where we're getting them further away it's very tricky the firstness secondness and thirdness but there's something to it i get the impression i sort of half understand it and it sort of stimulates other things that's why i bought a book on uh, pierce but the plot thickens pierce's sign does not function on its own but is a manifestation of a general phenomenon pierce identified three categories of phenomena which he labeled firstness secondness and thirdness right so try to relate this the realm of firstness is difficult to conceive but is usually understood in terms of feeling yeah yeah which example seems subjective amy amy if i was to send you the link would you join this event if you contact me on facebook i could send you the link for this event and we can discuss it Or maybe I could put the link in the chat and then other people can join and I won't add them. Because <laughs> it's only a. Right, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Wait a minute, let's have a look. Let's see what you've written. I'm having sure that. I'm having sure I will join. Give me a second, though. If you're in StreamYard, you could put the link. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, copy the clipboard. paste oh he did it twice anyhow so the realm of first is difficult to the realm of thing first just has no relations it is not to be thought of in opposition to another thing but it is merely a possibility it is like a musical note or a vague taste or a sense of color so i my idea is that what instincting experiences is firstness before you have categorized it like when i showed that weird object and you didn't know what it is i think that's within the realm of firstness uh secondness is the realm of brute facts which arise from a relationship so it might be if i then show an object and you know what it is then it's like this is so for instance right let's think about what signification though so or recognition where's that thing is that it that's it so when i show this and you don't know what it is it doesn't like then 
fit up like a chain of associations and a context into which it goes into. But if I show this, oh, it's a calculator. And then it's like a whole link of what this, here we go, I'm gonna put my headphones on. Greetings. I can't hear you, hang on. My phone's right. being uncorrect. There, can right. you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. All right, my phone's being uncorrect. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, this, um, this first, the second, this, the third, this, it, it's, it's like, it's hard to understand, but it's like something to it. It's very interesting. So is this, um, what is this, like, what is this? It's not socionics, it's this, uh. This, this is semiotics. Okay, this, so is, this, is 19, it, so. this is 19th century. This is Charles Sanders Pierce, and I can see why he was regarded as the greatest American philosopher. Okay. Um, so he really went to town on this semiotics stuff. He like came up with like thousands and thousands of different kinds of signs. Um, um, so in, how, does this like relate to like like say like Myers Briggs or? Or, or, no, 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 this is me getting on my high horse about socionics as an information dichotomy because socionics has a theory of information which I don't agree with because I okay. think it goes against sort of postmodernism and this idea of because, because, because when you get into socionics and if you have the understanding from Jung of uh, objective and subjective, of, I, I say empirical and subjective that the extroverted functions are empirical and the introverted functions are subjective. If you then go into socionics, you then learn, oh, we don't do that in socionics. We have the dichotomy of internal and external. And so that okay. then means that they are effectively saying that thinking and sensing are empirical, or ob no, not just empirical, objective, and feeling and intuiting are subjective so that means they see no subjective aspect to thinking no subjective aspect to sensing and it's like well it doesn't match my experience of reality and so, that's that's the problem and that's what i'm challenging directly and i keep and that's why and it, this goes because whenever i define the functions i really bang on about how the I bang on about the empirical nature of all the extroverting functions and the subjectifying nature of all the introverting functions. And a big part of Model V, just like in Hume, is like in an introvert, you've got the default, the default mode of operation, the default MO is introverting, yeah. subjectifying, and situationally, we are uh say extroverting empiricalizing and so we go towards the subjective factor but because socionics is looking at has this thing this starting principle of thinking as external well as soon as you buy into that you can't yeah. acknowledge any kind of subjective aspect of thinking and yeah. it's like you've got a problem with your principle then and yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm terrible with interrupting, just because like my brain's like going so fast. So, because I don't know a whole lot about the socionics. Like I literally just started watching some videos like this last weekend, and and I was. I guess the more reason I looked into it is because I, I, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure I'm INTP, but you know, it's as far as like you know, Young or Myers Briggs or whatever goes, um, and. For for me, it's like I struggle with some of the like, well, like with the extroverted feeling, like trying to like figure that out. And maybe it's because it's like, see, and I don't know, like a whole about. Oh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, it's probably extroverted, whatever intuition. My brain's just like in a million different places. But, <clears throat> um, so with the socionics, like I took the test like on their website, whatever. And it was mainly just cause I'm trying to like take as many tests as possible in different like areas to try to see like, you know, if it match, cause it seems like it all matches up pretty well. Um, um like well, when they relate it, I guess. Um, if I'll uh, give some tests in the chat. So there's one called best, um, best fit 
tight.com and that's where you do temperament and interaction mm -hmm. style and that's how Dario Nardi types people but now he also has a cognitive processes assessment and that's at keys to I've, I've done the keys of cognition one I've done yeah. um uh, let's see here if I can even um do this because I'm on my phone um and, yeah that test's been taken about 140,000 times the, yeah. I don't want to say the 140,000 people have taken it because I know a lot of people have taken it more than once. Right. Um, I, I took the keys of cognition one. I only took it once. Um, <clears throat> and they, I remember I can't look it up being on because I'm only on my phone and I can't like switch between the two. If I, if I try to look at that picture, it'll like cut me off here because I did like a screenshot of it. But the right. keys of cognition said, I'm pretty sure it was that one. They give you like three different, um, three different types, I believe. Um, oh, maybe it was a different one. Ah, I can't remember. Um, but I was, um, uh, it gives you, wait, maybe it wasn't keys to cognition. I know I did that one though. And that one came out INTP as well. Um, right. Um, yeah, Socionics tests aren't very good because they don't, they have a very um, hard line. <laughs> approach when it comes to JP mm. and the the nub of the matter is is that so I know Haley and I know Sabrina they're both like strong INTJs and, and functionality they are N-I-T-E and both of them have got very strong TE so it would be very difficult to design JP questions where they would come out as a perceiver because you'd have to Come up with questions to get around that TE and to get towards that NI. And so, just from a practical point of view, and to make and the set of questions for introverts, I think would have to be different from extroverts. And so, the MBTI contribution, in my opinion, was saying, okay, we, our JP questions go towards the top extroverted function. And they had a feeling that the way people operate in the world is through their top extroverted function. And so, and also, if you ask questions about people's actions rather than their thoughts, I think people are more likely to be honest because they could sort of think they're more organized than what they are. But if it's like, do you do this? Do you do that? Then it's like, it's more like if someone actually does the thing that shows they are externally organized that's more maybe believable it's like where the rubber meets the road in terms of the actions of somebody whereas if mm -hmm. you ask questions about someone's internal state about to try and work out their internal organization then i think oh yeah i'm organized but without actually having like any proof to show that <laughs> oh, they're man. internally organized because most not many people are going to say oh no no I'm, internally i'm a mess no <laughs> it's like so and especially if they're a rational type, a rational type would not own up to their internal irrationality, which is one of the reasons why INTJ doesn't talk. Very rarely they talk about their NI mm -hmm. uh, stuff. And, you know, it's hard for them to put it into words and they don't want to tell people anyway. Because um, right. uh, they yeah. like the, thinking about convincing people through a fact. And it's that thing of because I and if you see the videos I did with Haley, this is like a theme with her oh yeah and, so, and also I, I asked another INTJ female it might be the fact that uh and this is just the hypothesis just the tendency at the moment INTJs might think more non-verbally and INTPs might think more verbally right um but if the INTP is like in a realm of mathematics then they're probably not going to be verbal they'll be more like thinking the language that in the language of of maths um, so I'll just do a bit more on secondness. So, uh, secondness is the realm of brute facts, which arise from a relationship. So it would be like that thing. That's the top of a typewriter. And if people don't know what it, what it means, it's like, it's still like within the realm of firstness, in my opinion, like just the actual sensory data. And then it's like, okay, that's a, and so it's like, you go, Oh, that's a calculator. And it's like, it is used for. And then you have it conjures a whole context of the uses of a calculator. And so we could say maybe that relates to secondness. 
Secondness is the sense that arises when, in the process of closing a door, it is found that the door is stuck as the result of the object being in the way. The relation is discovered and the world is revealed to be made up of things and their coexistence with other things. Well, you can say that in that, like, this is used for that sort of thing. So I, 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 I'm going to go with that for secondness, at least when you recognize something. Uh, act know it. Uh, oh, did I add something to 28 and 29? I'm just going to check because I might have made it a bit clearer by annotating it. Right. Uh, oh, yes, I added quite a bit because that this is where it gets complicated. So uh, I don't know if you know about this website. I found this one randomly and it gives like a, I put it in the private chat part. Um, okay. Michael Callow's test that does like, the, I don't know, my young, my big, whatever. But it's actually really good because it gives you choices and it gives examples. Like my, my main problem with a lot of the mainstream tests are that they it's like the questions are so open to damn interpretation interpretation like yes. well, what does that really mean well, there you go that's the proof <laughs> like, that's, so it's it's like just, just, what i've been banging on about for about the past hour the questions are open to interpretation right and thinking this, <laughs> the yeah, subjective this, part this website i really really liked it i mean it gives you you know which one is more like you and it um it gives you examples. Do you like actual literal examples of what the question is actually asking? And it goes through all four dichotomies, the thinking, feeling, introverted, extroversion, um, yeah. judging, oh. perceiving, whatever. And then at the yeah. end, it also has like other questions that I, I think based upon whatever your answers are, it kind of, um, I would guess like um, d d d distinguishes between the two. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the online tests aren't very good. It's better just to sort of say, read, like, sort of get to it from lots of different angles. Um, and, right. like, so read Kersey, make sure you're a, an NT, which you probably are. And, oh, I, <laughs> I have and no then, doubt about the NTP. No right, doubt. It's uh, whether uh, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's more the functions. Because I started right. doing, like, like the, the function stack. And for me, I'm stuck between ENTP and INTP because I cannot quite figure out whether it's the extroverted intuition or the introverted thinking, which is top. Well, and then, and then the feeling sensing gets me confused because it's well, really just a flipped thing. Well, so yeah, it's it's. Well, there's two ways to distinguish between ENTP and two main ways to distinguish between ENTP and INTP. One is interaction style, <laughs> and. Uh, collaborator versus accommodator, get things going versus behind the scenes. And another one is to look at the weakest function, the vulnerable function, whether it's FI or SE. Okay, so... So if you have problems in the FI okay, area... Like, if, are you going with like the eight functions then, like the shadow yeah, functions? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Okay. But like if FI, like ENTPs have bad FI, and, e and INTPs have worse SE. Okay. So if they're hmm. really thinking about what your weakest function is, that will be a big clue. And also intertype relations. So, uh, like I was trying to explain earlier, I uh, half my people that I talk to, they I need to come with, with an interpreter because I just, I, I just like say what's like off the top of my head. And then sometimes I work it out like as I'm going. Um, Right. So, and and um, like for me, like like the, the introverted sensing is very strong. And but that's where I'm getting confused with like I suppose like I I had I see I don't even know how to explain it. Like it's it's the way I understand it. Extroverted sensing would be like you're like way like you know everything that's going around you. And I'm very alert to like like for me, like this would be maybe a weird example, but I hate wearing headphones. Because when I feel like both my ears are covered, I can't hear what's going on around me <clears throat> if right. something were to happen. Um, <clears throat> but then, and I have, I tend to have kind of more like a photographic memory. So if I see something somewhere once, whether or not it was relevant, I can like kind of like be like, oh, I seen this here. And then, um, and then with like the, with the FEFI, when I see it, like I can pick up on vibes of other people pretty quick. Um, like, like if someone doesn't like me or if there's like an uncomfortable, like 
whatever. And maybe, maybe it's my introverted feeling that's like messed up and maybe I'm interpreting thing, things wrong, but I don't usually, I don't really think so. Um, um, and I can, I can like see how other people are feeling very well. But if someone asks me like, 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 uh, like the guy I date, he, he'll be like, he'll be like, Oh, you're so hot. I'm like, eh, thanks. Like, cause I don't know how to respond to that. Um, Right. So I don't know if that makes sense. And it's not that I don't feel it. It's just I don't know how to express like, like I know what I'm feeling, but actually getting it out of my mouth is like something else. Right. Because <laughs> ENTP doesn't really know how they're feeling. Right. Yeah. It's like, uh, like, so, the expression, like so having the words and knowing the words to express a feeling is a difference. Is a different thing. Um, and it might be like a more vulnerable thing too, like, like, um, like I know how I'm feeling, but how to put it into words. Right. Um, so what I think is if we, uh, so I've, I've been, if we do these two ones, okay. then right, if we go through so what we got here. Um, okay, thirdness. Uh, above all for Pierce, the crucial category is thirdness, the realm of general laws. Where secondness amounts to brute facts, thirdness is the mental element. For Pierce, oh, right. Mm. For Pierce, mm, that's the thing where if you say a calculator, it's like that's an example of this. Over there, mo is this uh, second is amounts of brute facts. Third, this is the mental element. For Pierce, the third brings a first into relation with the second. Right. As in as you uh, giving A gives to B and Z. Right. Okay. So. Okay. So that might be when I hold up the calculator. Oh, right. And it's like. I know what this is because I know that that is a calculator and a calculator is like a general category. And because you know the general category, you then know what this is. Right. You, you have to know. It's like with a type. If you don't know the, if you don't know the types, you can't say that somebody is say is an example of a type. Um, uh, transposed onto Piers' sign triad, the categories result in the following. Okay, so right. like, I'm missing what, what's the first? <laughs> this, this is this, it's complicated. It's oh, like that's oh. why I bought a book. Okay. On so it. it's the, like the, the so, first this is the raw thing. I think it's the raw thing. It might just be like, and in, in functional terms, it might con might correspond to the realm of senses okay no, wait, okay wait no so it says the, the the realm of firstness is difficult to conceive because it's usually understood in terms of feeling and then on the other page so i i think that's what i was saying like with the whole like the before i jumped on here like the the music thing like if, if the dude pianist plays like a part the the firstness that's going to be hard because that's that's subjective completely subjective um but then it said on the other page, it said the secondness was the actual fact, the thing. And then the thirdness was how uh, it was on the other page. But yep. um, so then it says, yeah, the, realm of general uh, laws. the third brings the first into relation with the second. So the third, okay, secondness, secondness is the brutal fact. So the secondness would be the calculator itself. I think um, so. And then, I think so. uh, and then the third is like the category of what it is. Yeah, yeah. So it's and like, how, yeah. And then if you know whether or not that's right, then that would go to the first one. Because it's saying the, for the third brings the first into relation with the second. And Yeah, yeah, because it's like the, the and fact then is the first like, has to, the, It's like the first has yeah. to come after the second and the third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like recognized, categorized. You need to know the category in order to categorize it. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so the 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 fact gives to um, the the uh, the uh, yeah, because, third. Because, yeah because in that it's example the general laws so, yeah because 
because that example of the where you say it is a calculator well or, or, or maybe maybe you could just be like uh what are those things that, that they use back in the day uh abacus. yes the abacus so it's yeah. like you could look at the abacus you might know what it is um and then the like the thirdness like the general law is like it could be a calculator it could, oh, be, right. abacus, it could be you know writing it down and yeah, then you, can, you have to have being you have to have the facts and yeah. the category to bring about how you feel about it. Yeah, you could you could I, show an abacus to somebody who has never heard of one before, and it's like they just like see it as these things and move it's like that might be like within the realm of firstness. Right. But, um, well, no, because firstness is all about feeling. Is what I'm getting from this. The first. Well, yeah, it might be like. It, because of, it, it might yeah. be, I might say it's like, if, if we say like emotional response to a stimulus, and mm. I mean, what? Well, I'm sort of, what I'm doing now is I'm sort of overwriting it with my own subjective factor <laughs> in that I'm saying that the, the, the firstness is, is I, I think it's the sensory qualities of the object. And so, like I said, with an abacus, you you said, okay, these things move around. I don't know what it's for. I don't know what it does. I can't categorize this thing. I just have these. Um, right. And it's like well, that, that would be the th that would be the third, I would think, because then the second is the fact. So then, if you tell somebody, okay, well, this is like a calculator, and that because it says the second has the fact, like the actual concrete, like fact of whatever it is, and so you have to have. Right. That's so that, different then. Yeah. Like the thirdness, that's the way I'm taking this. Like the thirdness has to be like a general, like like uh like a general category. And yes. then right. and then um, you break down that category with the fact. And you're like, okay, well then I can put, you know, the you know, the 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 fact, so the second and the third, and then you can't get without the second and the third of what it is and what it could be, then you get the feeling. Of how you feel yeah. about it because it's saying that the firstness is hard to conceive because it's a feeling thing yeah so like how you're feeling so i mean the the calculator advocacy is probably not like a good uh like representation of it but like the music thing would make more sense with that yeah it's like it's this bit here it's like the relation is discovered and the world is revealed to be made of things and their coexistence with other things so it's like so you, you present the calculator to a to a uh, to a caveman like you teach him English, <laughs> you go through the whole process just to get to this hypothetical, and um, then it's like or someone who's lived in a culture that where they've not come across a calculator. And it might have like it might have been a child who's lived up the whole life in the outback right. in Austria. And not, like and say it was like and you got this situation. It's like. It's like, when it says the relation is discovered, the world is revealed to be made up of things and their coexistence with other things. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you, and if you don't know how that thing relates to other things, now, as they say, might play with the calculator and press some of the buttons, just say it was on, and things come up, they'll learn a little bit about it. But if it's like, completely out of context and there's no frame of reference it's like if you say to somebody who knows <laughs> nothing about typology and you were to say oh she's an entp and it's like you might as well say she's an xyzw <laughs> right right it, it's like, just if, it's if just you don't know what it means. right you don't know what it means at all um right. uh, yeah well like you're saying she's a cpa <laughs> it's, like, not. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh it's just only these kind of like right but if i didn't know what a cpa was yeah you know, i believe it's a, a certified accounting yeah something. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So like if i didn't know if i didn't know what that meant like if i were to say you're having surgery tomorrow and you have to be npl if you yeah. don't know what npl means you're gonna be like huh yeah yeah <laughs> so, so I mean, this is the, the, that's why this that's why um, the subjective and the empirical is such a big part. Um, well, so and that's, well, you you kind of mentioned something earlier, I, and I'm not sure if this is like. Pro, pro, I'm I'm gonna 
think it's part of your rant towards the socionics thing as far as like without the without like um uh oh my head just lost your thought so like it's like the the intuition like the extroverted intuition like i can see possibilities for everything so it's like um <clears throat> but if you don't have some sort of framework to base like like um like i, I probably better to explain like in a story so like my father was trying to um put this big like ice fishing house like in the back of his truck and he it was getting like stuck on a bump and he needed something to like to have it like get over that hump right. like, like a like a tube of some sort just to get it up over it and so i'm sitting here i'm thinking i'm like and he's like he's like i don't have anything like that i'm like i'm like i'm thinking to myself i'm like like picturing in my head like all the different objects that i've seen around that that could possibly work that would be like the right size to use it like, like a lever kind of, or like, like the, right. I guess like, like a teeter totter, like the part in the middle to try to like, get it up over that hump, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm like, Oh, I seen this old part of PVC pipe that might work. And so I ran and went and got it. And, and I don't know if that's like, and like, I'm thinking that's probably like an extroverted intuition type thing. Or if I'm looking at something and I'm like, huh, that's like not working right. Like, okay. And I'll sit there and I'll try and figure out, like I'll play with a little bit like, okay, this is why it's not working. Or like my boyfriend, he's got a headphone set that is completely jacked up. It's like, it wants a static and crackle all the time. And I'm like, he was playing, I was watching him one day, like FaceTime and I could see it had, it was coming. Like every time he moved, I could see it was coming from the one cord going into the jack. I'm like, no, yeah, I'm, like, yeah. I'm yeah. like, it's the cord that's going into your headphone. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. but just it, maybe that comes from introverted sensing or just from knowing what I already yeah. know. Yeah, there's a bit of so the thing is you get the the SI with the NE sort of working together in that, right. and also but this then, percep perception of similarities is a big part of right. NE, and but so then, I need something <laughs> like this that can do this. Right, right, but right. then you have to also use go into like the the me i see and i don't know like as i know i'm ti so and i'm and i'm not quite sure like i don't know how like extroverted uh thinking really goes like like because i just i don't know as much about them functions but i i know i'm not that but um but then it goes into the thinking like i have to think it out internally like so it's just it's such a fast like thing and that's maybe why i have such a problem trying to figure out like what is like the dominant function here like it's it's yeah. either n or ti it's, i'm just not sure which one <laughs> and also it's like in an nt all the nt functions are strong the difference is whether it's valued or right. not and the ones that are valued tend to be practiced more so as for the uh, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, I've sort of like, like I said, I've got the firstness over the sign, the secondness over the object, and the thirdness over the interpretant. And so, like with the sign, it's like the sensory qualities of the sign before you know what it is. Um, and then we've got, wow, well, what's this one here? The reason yeah. for mapping the three categories onto the triadic elements. Because that's an, like feeling, because that's the feeling. It's how the yeah. actual object is with. Uh, yeah, I think that was just one example of the feeling because he was like giving the example of music. But like the feeling part would be like, again, if we think of instinct and emotion as like the emotional reaction to the stimulus, like if you hear music, the sense of the music and your emotional reaction to the music is all bound up together in that experience um right. so um and then we got An here experience would be sensing basically, sensing right? sensing with emotional reactions there too bound up with it so for example you look under a rock and you see something disgusting you go Ugh! that is part of the emotional reaction is part of the sensing and therefore that's why we we're changing that word to instincting Van der Hoek mm. called it instinct. I call it instincting to make them all ings because Dario changed intu intuition to intuiting. 
So I call that instincting because it's all about in the way the brain is structured. The um, it's like if you see someone who's hot, your sensing of that person and your emotional reaction to their hotness is all bound up together. Right. Uh, yeah. It's all so, it, it, inseparable. So yeah, you, look, you you look under a rock and you see something gross. You're like, "Hey, that's gross," and then that creates the feeling. Yeah, I mean, subsequently, it's then, but then Van der Hoop, like, he did this thing about the difference between an emotion and a feeling and um, feelings being more sophisticated. It's like anger versus right. indignation. Right, so, let me go here. But aren't those uh, both feelings? Well, it moves, <laughs> it's a different sphere. That's the thing. It's because emotion is, emotion is the then, then you have to separate an emotion from a feeling in that you do have a limbic emotions like a dog okay. feels emotions um so initially pierce posited 10 sign types then he revised the order to 66 signs before eventually coming up with the troublesome figure of 59,049. <laughs> it will be difficult to go through all of these however we can begin to look at the process by which such sign types might be generated if the sign is a triad sign object interpretant then it has three formal aspects firstness secondness and thirdness respectively these formal aspects in turn bear in relation to the categories firstness, secondness, and thirdness of existence or phenomena in general. Um, the interaction of formal aspects of signs and aspects of being can be envisaged in terms of, of a sign generating graph. The rows consist of the categories firstness, secondness, and thirdness as they relate to each element of the sign triad. The columns consist of the categories as they relate to being, quality, brute facts, general laws, this sign this generates signs as follows so this this is the part where i got like the whole like moon thing because like the um like you were saying like the secondness is the icon so that's like the what it is like 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 the happy face um, yeah it's like it resembles then, the thing it's referring to and then the thirdness the possibility um which is where i came up with like right. the whole like people are just genetically predisposed Predis that predisposed, whatever that predisposed. word is. Predisposed, yeah. Um, to just naturally seeing faces like in things. Um, yes. Um, I, but the firstness thing is still kind of weird, which it said it kind of is. Like, um, so I'm not quite sure. Like, like the at least in this first column. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like different ways of understanding it. In that, um. So you can say, if you're looking at the quality sign, so it's like the smiley face. It's like its firstness. It's like its sensory, the sensory qualities of the sign, where it's like it, it resembles. Okay, two eyes and a smile. Right. It's not. It's not just like if you were to have like the word smile. In English and then in all these other languages but like, it's just by convention or like the word I'll, I'll give you a word I'll give you a word that is con uh, it's, its relation to the object is conventional what is a sabaka a what a sabaka there you don't know you said a what okay sabaka is Russian for dog okay so that, that is an arbitrary relationship between well sort of uh, from someone who doesn't know any Russian um, I only know a tiny bit is that uh, an arbitrary relation between the word and the thing you see the thing is it's not necessarily arbitrary because certain words are composed of other word roots and so it's like um the anglish for successor is after follower and so we know what after means and we know what follower means and so these components of the word so it's like i changed post socionics to after socionics so that to make it clearer people and because i was in a bit of a mood and so the people don't have to man man manually because then if because because so yeah i changed it to after socionics make it more distinctive like, what does that mean that sounds weird <laughs> so like, maybe like pick the interest of the mps um uh and like i said it is tricky to understand because part of what i'm doing is i'm understanding it in terms of other things and then um like i do think if you're going towards the qualities of something and like i said quality firstness 
that's the the sensory especially with music the sensory emotional qualities of music the sensory emotional qualities right um and or the sensory emotional qualities of any kind of sign or stimulus uh or it's like say there's a loud bang like you hear it but you also might scare you at the same time um so and and that part that older part of the brain the limbic system sensing and uh emoting shall we call it are all uh well, that's a different meaning sensing and emotion are all bound up together it's when we then if we recognize an object within the field of sensations we have we have used the material of of instincting and we've moved into the sphere of thought because it's like that is this this is an example of this and an understanding of like say with the calculator you, you as soon as you recognize an object you've moved into the realm of thought and so and this is something that Vanderhoek wrote about why he did not want to call sensing a perceiving function because he then said because first of all emotions in there and he said that uh perception is related to thought and that is actually consistent with modern cognitive psychology where perception is is one of the four main aspects of cognitive psychology where you've got perception memory linguistics and reasoning right. and those are all part of cognitive psychology and and perception is related to thought it was just like when you hear a word and uh, it's like picking out the words perceiving the words and the understanding of the words in speech when you can barely so it's like someone who's like who knows a language as a second language is it's usually harder for them for that person to understand like something that's barely audible and another person can like filling the gaps oh. and so so that's why i don't like um say se to me is not a perceiving function so it's like that was a misnomer because perception is it's the your you it's a part of cognitive psychology it's a part of thinking in reference to sensory qualities where you hear or you see sensory qualities and you then categorize them it's like we're just seeing these these markings on the screen these signs if this was in say chinese you would just see you you just be in the firstness of it of like the sensory qualities of the sign and like the shapes but we all of these words on the screen have sort of significance and we are sort of and that and you've moved from the realm of like i said you've moved into the realm of thinking because language is involved in thinking so it's like cognitive psychology so that's why i don't like perception so that's why i tend to call the perceiving functions the non-judging functions um uh and this and any i can give you an example of any uh what i can do is i can wind up the recording by giving an example of any um oh wait a minute i'll give you i'll just give you i'll give you the example of any after going through all this right this is where it gets this is where it gets a little bit more it puts a little bit more meat on the bones at the level of the sign representament a quality sign representament made up of a quality e.g the color green uh, a sin sign a representative made up of an existing physical reality, e.g. a roadside in a specific street. Ah, oh, so context is going to be important. Yeah, it's just like uh, a legi sign, a representative made up of a law, e.g. the sound of a referee's whistle in a football match. Right? At the level of the object, an icon where the sign relates to its objects in some resemblance with it, e.g. a photograph. So that resembles Marilyn Monroe. Mm -hmm. I can be all three a symbol where the sign relates to its object by means of convention alone word or flag index where the sign relates to its object in terms of causation weather cop medical symptom smoke in its relation to fire um at the level of the interpretant a third this is where it gets weird with the ream a ream where sign is represented 
for the interpretant as a possibility, e.g. a concept. And I'm like, mm, no possibilities of concepts. And it's like, mm, I have to think about that. Uh, a die sense where the sign is represented for the interpretant as a fact. So by going through this complicated stuff with people, I am now proven that thinking does need to be reinterpreted because we have to design and interpret it what this is really getting at. And we get the feeling that we're not quite understanding all of it. And we're actually also overlaying and, und and I, what I do is I'm understanding this in terms of what I already know and like a little bit in terms of functions. So right. again, subjective factor coming in. So I, so the, that bit of socionics annoys me that it, it does not acknowledge the subjective factor of the subjective part of reality. And I'll right. give an example in a moment, uh, an argument where the sign is represented for the interpretant as a reason is you proposition. The chief point to be made here is that these often abstract sign types provide the bare bones for larger semiotic, which invokes all manner of combinations. Right, here we go. Here's an example of such a combination. A football referee shows a red card to a football player who has committed a blatant professional foul. As the red card invokes rules, professional fouls are illegal and lead to penalties against the perpetrator. It is an argument. It is also symbolic. The red card signifies a professional foul by convention and therefore also a legis sign a general law. But the red card has been used before, but the red card has been used by referees before, and the players know this well enough. Therefore, this instance of the use of the red card acts as a brute fact, and as such is a dissent, indexical sin sign, a statement caused by the action of the referee of the facts of football protocol. The dissent, indexical sin sign is therefore a replica of the argument symbol legis sign. Right. So, the socionics people out there, you instantly understand all of that. Um, I understand but, it. If but, I sit there but, and if, think but if about nobody's it. ever been to a football game and they've never seen a red thing and they don't know what yeah, yeah, that means. Or, or what a professional foul is. Or that this well, is actually a drawing of Eric Cantona, a 1990s French footballer. Well, and in my mind, because I'm, I'm in the US, I'm thinking in my mind, football is not soccer. Like, yeah. But, like your your football, I I can tell, I think you're probably I don't know. Yeah, it's soccer. Yeah. British? Are you British or? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So like I, I can like your your football is different than my football, but I mean yeah. I would still I mean I suppose I would still interpret the color red as stop. Not maybe I might not necessarily know exactly what it means, yeah, but I have but... a general idea just from. Yeah. You know, and, just from life. And, and even that's convention because like some products like if the product is on it's got a red light on it if it's on standby it's got a red light on it or it's got a green light on it or it's got a blue light on it and so the convention or like this sign a-ok -okay, like in south america outside of brazil that that means okay but that's very rude in brazil oh well yeah i, I took a communications class like a yeah, yeah. uh, year or two ago mm, and right so that's going to relate to semiotics communications that's going to overlap big time with semiotics okay so well and then also like whether or not um like well yeah like the aok -okay sign like if you were to go to like uh like australia i believe that meant you're calling someone an a-hole <laughs> possibly uh, um, but, and, 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 so for instance, in, in england and australia that is rude that's the v sign that's the forks but that's not rude in the united states Oh yeah, yeah. It, oh yeah, yeah. So like, right, and, the, the, yeah. Here, that would be like a peace right, sign. Right. So that there's an example of something we can look at in the realm of FE. In the realm of FE, in the realm of FE, that's a symbol. In that, but, and so, uh, Paul Ekman would call that a, ge a gesture. In that, that is a yeah. culturally specific sign. Other cultures right. have different interpretations. But yeah, exactly. what, what Paul Ekman learned is that these facial expressions go across all cultures. And so I would argue they are more empirical than words. Yet socionics would say that thinking is external and feeling is internal. But if we, again, if we're talking about words related to thought, but that's arbitrary, they're mere symbols. It's like what I said with Sabak. It's like Sabaka, dog, or I think French calls it a chien. But if we look at, if you're watching a, a foreign language film, you can understand the person through their affect display. 
right. what's going on. That's more, so I could argue that that needs less reinterpretation than a language where you have to know the language and people know right. language to different degrees. And, and I would say for an FE Dom, the world of feelings is much more real to them right. than uh, the world of uh, thought with its various slippages and changings in meanings and things like that. And it depends on the context and your interpretation depends on what you know. Now, also in the realm of feelings, though, I, I've, I've focused on the empirical aspect, but there is also the subjective aspect in that semi in that you then get the thing of okay what is and that's like when i did that thing where you do a reaction shot shot of the actor but if you put it after different preceding shots mm -hmm. that reaction shot is interpreted differently so for example a dog, a, dog, a, dog, a dog gets shot and blown away and then you cut to the actor and he smiles then you think oh what a sick bastard Right, right. But right. if you're smiling and then the dog gets shot and you don't yeah. show like the actor. It's yeah. like Or oh, you then like, put a baby, or you put a baby, a baby in the cart, mm -hmm. then cut to the actor smiling. Oh, what a kind soul. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it's you you've got like, like so that you see how the, the context is very much affected and like all of these little things and you'll have learned that from communication, like the context and first impressions and all of that sort of stuff. Right. Well, and it um, also, it depends on, like, the different, like, where you are in the world, too. Like, cultures, like, like yes. for instance, like, um, I, and I didn't actually learn this in, like, my, uh, in my class, but I was watching a YouTuber who was Russian, and she was talking about how it was so different between Russia and America as far as, like, how people are smiley. Like, in Russia, they don't just smile at anybody. They're just, like, stone-faced. Um, and so when she came to America, she thought it was so bizarre that everybody would like, like you'd walk by someone on the street and just smile at them because well, well, here but, it's like it's kind of like a polite thing to do, but yeah, in Russia but, they don't do that. Yeah, and so also weird. Yeah, but I also <laughs> would say in the United States, not so much New York, more so the South. But um, getting back to this, in the um, so I'm going to give you the example of okay, I'm going to give you the example of something I learned from Robert McKee. This is about the gap between expectation and result, and this will show people that the empirical and the subjective exists, and I believe this needs to be acknowledged in typology. So, you've then got, so Robert McKee would talk about the protagonist in a story, the protagonist is on a quest, the protagonist takes an action to uh, achieve the objective. It might be the scene objective, which is a a subset to the super objective. So it might be the super objective of the movie might be to uh, uh, romance a particular person. Right. And so the person makes a move, or it might be, oh, I quite like her. And he go, makes a move to talk to her. And he's thinking about, okay, if I say this and I do this, she'll, res she'll probably respond in this way. <laughs> and then she responds, drop dead creep. And it's like, oh, the gap has just opened between your subjective view of reality and the how the world actually reacts and then in the story theory it's then how then that person reacts how does the protagonist react to that new set of circumstances of um and it's like and then that shows their that. character and so you've got um of you've got choices taking actions actions leading to the world reacting in a way not as expected and so you've got this, that the way the world is is different from the way we think the world is and getting these gaps between expectation and results. And when these are good, these are called plot twists that make, so a uh, silly question. Have you seen the end of the, have you seen Empire Strikes Back? Okay, so I'm, I'm terrible, terrible with movies. I okay, saw uh, have you seen, uh, okay, I so I'll, I'll, I'll spoil it for you. So <laughs> Empire Strikes Back, I will spoil it because you should have seen I, I it. Did, right, did, anyway, so, I, I, so Empire I, I, Strikes Back, so, do you know who Luke Skywalker's father is? Yes, Darth Vader. Right, Darth Vader. But if you're watching that, so, George Lucas asked child psychologists, are the kids going to be able to take this? And he said the kids would just deny it because he thought it might cause them, like, uh, trauma if they found out that Darth that Vader was, was oh. there, right? So, he checked with the child psychologists. and uh, But the point is, Luke goes to fight Darth Vader... And he has certain expectations 
and it's like okay i've done my training i've gone with this little green frog here i'm gonna beat this darth vader guy this is some old guy in a suit he goes to fight him and the audience identify with how many times in a movie does the the hero lose gets his hand cut off and it's like well i wasn't expecting that that's a gap between expectation and result and the audience is thinking bloody hell the hero's just been defeated by the villain that's one next one obi-wan never told you who your father was no you tell me you can i am your father another gap he wasn't expecting that right third gap you know together we could beat the emperor we could rule as father and son so he's just offered him a job another gap and then it's sort of unclear but robert mckee thinks that luke decided to kill himself by jumping off but again that's a reading how we interpret the actions um so again sensing thinking needs to be interpreted uh, everything needs to be interpreted it's just that sort of degree um so for example the word cow doesn't need to be interpreted as much as the word empathy <laughs> in, terms, in terms of what we mean um I think cow is like a moo cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or even if I say dog, where it's getting, no, you, no, you're interpreting, you're, 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 yeah, and you're <laughs> interpreting of dog. I might say there's a dog next door, but it's like, what kind of dog? Like, exactly. it's just a vague image of one. Um, so this whole thing, it's like the empirical and the subjective is a part of reality, and you then cannot say that thinking is make thinking out to be this thing that is like it's almost as if someone is an 18th century rationalist philosopher and thinking is unimpeachable and is never wrong and it's like yeah okay well what you've done there yeah. socionics you is you've, con you've that, they've confused right. logic they've confused logic with all thinking and well, yeah because like if, if you're looking at like science like say like medicine or something Something can be fact today, and then they could might find something else tomorrow. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, exactly. Th yeah, there's I, always possibilities, and yeah, I mean, right. So, yeah. I, I I can finish with a um, uh, an example of any, which is the best example I can think of. So Douglas Adams. So he wrote the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Have you heard mm -hmm. of it? I've heard of it. I know it's a movie and it's a book, but right, okay. wait, 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 wait. I think I have seen it. That's where the guy, he's like, um, uh, so now I'm going back into like my, probably my, I'm going to think it's my introverted sensing because I'm trying to remember this. Yeah. But okay. like, the dude's like in a house and he has a blanket and then it's a guy and oh, she's an actress. Um, uh, the dark brown hair. But they end up Zoe, like, Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll yeah, give you yeah, an example. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll trust you. Deschanel, you've yeah. heard it. Okay, yes, so I, in the radio I, series, I, so in the radio series, 1978, Douglas Adams, ENT preferences up to the wazoo. He decides to put his two lead characters, Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect, um, in supreme jeopardy. He's thrown them out into cosmic space and he says they're going to die within 30 seconds unless they're rescued. Because the, the world like blew up or some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's let's just go within this. Let's just say thirty seconds. It, I think right. they probably might die before then, but let's just go with that figure. That's the cutoff okay. point. Mm -hmm. So, and then we say, and then all of the solutions. He said he kept coming up with all of these solutions to saving Ford and Arthur, but the problem was all of these solutions were highly improbable. And he's like, he's stuck on this. He can't think of a solution. Then he watches a program on judo and he hears the instructor saying when you've got a larger opponent coming against you you have to use the weight of your opponent against him right so i'll ask you uh, so it's then then douglas adams with his ne he then hears that weight of the opponent against him and he's like mm, something in that yeah and yeah. now now i've got to try and disentangle which bits are intuiting and which bits are thinking and so i think the intuiting is when he is ex, sort of like gets what? to the essential relationship of the example where he says so you so you you you're in a judo match against somebody and your judo match and your opponent is heavier use their weight against them and he is able to and then because of the context of his problem, he's then able to sort of get the essential. It's almost like 
So with a metaphor, the relationship between the elements is the same, but the elements are different. The relationship between the elements of the larger opponent against you, use the strength against the weakness, it is then able to like sort of like see the relation between the elements and to say, okay, it's, and they were able to take that principle and make it larger and go from use the weight of the opponent against himself to the weight of the problem against itself. So I think that's the any part with a little bit of thinking in. And then he goes, okay, what's my problem? Improbability. How do I take the weight of the problem with my problem, which is I have to rescue Arthur Dent and Ford Prefect, but all my attempts at rescue are highly improbable. And then, okay, okay I'm going to use this problem and make it the solution. And he then generates the infinite improbability generator, which, which, rescue, the which rescues them precisely because it is so improbable. And Arthur is, and Ford is rescued by his semi cousin, Zaphod Beeblebrox, and the other person, and, and Arthur is rescued on the same ship by Trillian, who is played by Joey Deschanel, was the woman that Arthur failed to get off with at a party. What a coincidence! But you see, the problem has been made into the solution, the weakness has been made into the strength, and that I believe is an example of any. And uh, we can say TI, but, but certainly uh, the intuition, the perception of similarities and the thinking. And so I give that as an example of, and that is a, a feature of any, or rather NPs tend to be the best at transcontextual thinking. That is what Dario has shown from his research. Right. And so See, I tend to, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how the movie goes. Like, I know they end up on the spaceship. I know there's, like, this other villain guy. There's, like, three of them. And then at some point, I remember they're, like, crawling through some, like, ice caves or snow storm or something. And then they end up, if I remember right, yeah, at that... some statue thing that's, like, telling them the key to what they have to do to save the universe or whatever. Yeah, the hell yeah. Then what they did is they, um, like... They I don't it... the exact context. I know i seen it, but it was so many years ago. Yeah, because what they did is they, um, once they get once they get rescued by the improbability field, they then see all of these improbable things and they get turned into like wool, woolen versions of themselves. I right remember then. something about a coffee pot. <laughs> right, <laughs> or like yes. That. Right. <laughs> right then. And I know so, there was something weird with that. Right, so like. I'm going to end the broadcast now and then okay. I'm going to sign off with um, Amy.